Hello everyone, I'm Sybil Starr and I'm here to give the astrology forecast for the Aquarius full moon that occurs on August 19th at 27 degrees, 15 minutes of Aquarius at 1126 a.m. Pacific time. This is a super powerful full moon with much intensity and, and some really big changes and disruptive energy. Um, and it is time for some big changes. You know, it's uh, Aquarius is ruled by Uranus and Uranus is super strong at this Aquarius full moon. Um, all of the planets actually are involved in this full moon, as well as several asteroids. The divine feminine has a really strong voice at this full moon. Uh, and as we know, all full moons are a time when emotions run high, and it's also a time to connect with others. And what was planted at the Leo new moon on August 4th blooms at the full moon. And so what was planted on August 4th was courage, heart healing, leadership, remembering our own true divine nature and that we are never alone in this ascension process of our consciousness moving into these higher frequency vibrations. The whole universe is help, here to help us make this shift. And the astrology is showing us how to navigate the territory and align ourselves with these higher frequency vibrations and, and the light that is coming in. All right, so for I'm gonna show you uh, the chart of the, um, let's see here, share screen, here we go, all right. All right, so this is the um, Aquarius full moon. Like I said, it occurs on August 19th at 11.26 a.m. Pacific time. So the moon is here at 27 degrees, 15 minutes of Aquarius, and it opposes the sun at 27 degrees, 15 minutes of Leo. And of course, we always look at the axis of this energy when um, at the full moon, because the moon has no light of her own. She is reflecting the light of the sun. So we'll be looking not only at the Aquarius full moon, the Aquarius moon, but at the axis of the Leo Aquarius axis. Uh, so the sun is tightly conjunct Mercury at 26 degrees of um, Leo and it's retrograde. Also conjunct Vesta, okay? Here is Vesta, she's the priestess energy. It's a very powerful energy, a lot of Leo here. Um, and as I said, Uranus plays a huge role. Uranus is over here at 27 degrees of uh, Taurus, uh, 27 degrees, 11 minutes. So a very tight square there, okay? And it actually makes a grand cross because Uranus is also opposite Athena. Some asteroids, there's some very powerful asteroids uh, involved in this uh, a full moon, okay? And then we also have another, well, we, we also, the Yod is still in effect because uh, it's definitely within range of the uh, in conjunct between Neptune and these three Leo uh, points here. And it's also in conjunct Pluto, in conjunct or quincunx, they mean the same thing, 150 degrees. And then Pluto and Neptune are in a very tight sextile, okay? So that's, that creates a, a, another yacht that we've been talking about all month, yacht or finger of fate or finger of God. And then there's another whole pattern that is very active. And that is, uh, we've got a T-square with Saturn here at 17 degrees of Pisces, opposite uh, Venus at 18 degrees of Pisces. And Venus is also conjunct Black Moon Lilith. So we've got another really strong feminine energy here. And these, this opposition is in a square to Jupiter at 17 degrees of Gemini and Mars at 19 degrees of Gemini. So that is a T-square. So basically all of the planets are involved in this full moon and three asteroids. So it, it, it's super powerful. All right, so now let's talk about what all of this means. 
Okay. All right, so as we said, the Leo Aquarius axis is, is the energy, is the basic energy of this full moon. And so to me, it's uh, one of the, a really good analogy that I like for this axis is the fact that Leo rules the heart and Aquarius rules the vascular system. And so, you know, it is in our heart that we, you know, that's where the love, that's the, the spark of creator lives within us. Uh, Leo is ruled by the sun, which is once again, that divine spark, love as a state of being, not necessarily as an emotion, as a state of being. And so it says to me about open your heart and share the love because Aquarius then carries that vibration, not only throughout our body as the vascular system, but uh, it, it's networking. It takes it out into the world. It spreads the love and then it brings it back. Just like in the vascular system, the heart, we know it's not really a pump, but, but that is kind of how it functions. Um, is it pumps the blood through the body and then it returns the oxygenated blood, then it returns uh, the blood to the heart to be reoxygenated. Okay, so it becomes a loop of love. And so we're being asked to let our light shine and spread and disperse that light as an energetic and electrical network all over the world, raising the vibration of the collective as we raise our own. Um, the Leo Aquarius axis is the desire to be seen and acknowledged by Leo versus the desire for autonomy and freedom by Aquarius. It's the individual consciousness versus group consciousness. And they're both important. It's not like one's more important than the other. You know, as we say, the highest good of all, we want the highest good of all. And that includes, it has to be the highest good of everyone in the group to be the highest good of all. But as we work together, the group consciousness brings a tremendous power. Um, it's about the heart and mind connected, conscious co-creation with the mind in service to the heart. The mind, which is light, and that's Aquarius, creates form, but the frequency is determined by the heart and the intention by behind the creation. Conscious co-creation is when we are living from the heart, we can direct our mind to work the quantum field and the higher frequency vibrations to create the world we want. All right. So the Aquarius moon, uh, of course, you know, the moon is our heart. It's our emotional body. And in Aquarius, it's highly intuitive, very ahead of their times. Aquarius sees out into the future. They say Aquarius is at least five years ahead of everyone else. Aquarius is known as the water bearer. It is pouring the waters of cosmic wisdom. And some say, of course, that the um, energy, that the, the lines, or excuse me, the symbol for Aquarius is not only water, but electricity. As you can see, I have an electrical storm going on behind me because it is about an electrical storm um, and lightning. Uh, Aquarius is known as the, the light bringer. Uh, the age of Aquarius is the age of the light bringer. It's also the sign of revolution, the maverick, and the new age. When the moon is in Aquarius, there can be an attraction to all that is new and unusual. Um, and it is a time that actually promotes social gatherings, especially at the, the full moon, which is already about connection with others. It is a time to work with groups for uh, create goals for the future, brainstorming new ideas and change. Okay. Uh, but Aquarius also, Aquarius moon also requires emotional space and freedom. Uh, it brings us into unity consciousness, which is about bringing our own unique gifts and working with each other. If the shadow is herd mentality, where we just all get in line and uh, be the same, but, it, but it's just not that way. It's really about bringing our own gifts and working together. Um, our own uniqueness is important now, and we and we do need a sense of belonging to find our own tribe. And Aquarius can be called a misfit, so it's trying to find it's it's about finding our own tribe of misfits. Uh, 
The shadow of one of the shadows of Aquarius is detachment, emotional detachment. But I feel like it's more that's more of a defense mechanism around feeling different and rejected. Because Aquarius moon, and we can have we can have a hard time finding where we do belong until we recognize our own uniqueness and that we are a group of misfits. Okay. All right. Uh, Mercury, god of the mind, is retrograde in Leo, conjunct this sun and opposite the moon. And of course, Mercury retrograde tells us it's time to reassess, reevaluate um, ideas, um, and we may have delays. But I feel like this particular one will allow us to have a new perspective, of course, because it's square Uranus. We saw that in the chart. Uh, we might change our mind about long held thoughts and beliefs and release dogmatic views as we open to the bigger picture of what is playing out in our world. Vesta, uh, the asteroid Vesta is in Leo and Vesta is the priestess archetype. And she has to do with devotion and service. And in Leo, it is to creativity and self-expression. Okay. And to one's own uniqueness, I would say. All right. Now, this um, Sun, Mercury, Vesta conjunction is conjunct with the star Alphard uh, at 27 degrees, 36 minutes of Leo. Alphard is at 27 degrees, 36 minutes of Leo in the constellation of Hydra, the water serpent. Hydra is a sister constellation to Sirius and very deeply involved in, in the Syrian female serpent mystery schools of kundalini, healing, oracle, prophecy, and assisting with death. Hydra is called the entwiner, the clinging star, the coil, and because it stands for the strands of DNA and the kundalini life force. Kundalini is the vital life force that runs through our body and brings enlightenment as it rises up our spine. It is when the Kundalini rises, it is an awakening and it is called the serpent energy. Uh, Mary Magdalene was said to be connected to Hydra through sacred sexuality. And if rem we remember last year, um, uh, Venus went Venus went retrograde at 28 degrees of Leo, uh, conjunct this star, okay? And so it is about the activation of the creative urge and the power of the divine feminine or the Shakti. That is what is rising. And I feel like it is, a, even though Aquarius is very much about the future, uh, and I feel like it, it is a piece of envisioning the future. And I feel like the future, this is showing us the future is bringing in the power of the divine feminine and the Shakti. Okay. Uh, and the, oh, I wanted to show you this as well. Uh, let me get this pulled up. The, um, um, the sun, um, excuse me, the moon of the chart of the United States is also activated by this full moon. Let me show it to you, okay. All right, so this is the Sibley chart uh, for July 4th at 1776, uh, 510 p.m. in Philadelphia. So, of course, you know, here is the sun of the United States at 13 degrees of uh, cancer, which is tightly conjunct uh, the star Sirius. You know, we are under the auspices and protection of the goddess Isis and the star Sirius. And our moon is here in Aquarius. The, it's at 27 degrees, 10 minutes of Aquarius, and is tightly conjunct Athena. Um, and Athena is a big player in this particular um, uh, a full moon. And so um, the moon in uh, the chart, the, the, this is called a mundane chart. And so the moon in a mundane chart, it has to do with uh, not only the emotions, but it has to do with women. It has to, and it has to do with people. And it, it's, whereas the sun, you know, and Leo is very much about kind of like the, um, you know, the ruler, 
And uh, whereas Aquarius, as well as the moon, are both about the people, the common people, but it's also very feminine. And so I wanted to point out that at this full moon, the Democratic Convention opens. Uh, they, they open on, uh, they be, it begins on August 19th, the day of the full moon. And, you know, I feel like the zeitgeist of what is moving forward with, with this chart is really saying it's about the divine feminine coming into their power. Uh, the, the zeitgeist is, is around women leadership. And I'm, and I'm talking about on all levels, not, not just for president, although we know there is a presidential candidate and I'm not giving an endorsement because I am an independent and I, I don't have, um, fond feelings for either party. So I can't really endorse the candidates themselves, but I do believe that it, the zeitgeist is moving into the divine feminine, really stepping into to leadership. And with Athena here, you know, there is there was the ancient prophecy that, um, you know, when Athena was born, she was born out of the, the head of, well, what happened was there was a prophecy that, Metis, who had become pregnant by Zeus, that the child she bore would overthrow uh, Zeus's rule. And Zeus, of course, represented, you know, the patriarchal dominator uh, ship that was happening at that time. And so he swallowed Metis, Athena's mother. And but Athena came was born. She she came out of his head full grown. Uh, even though he tried to not have her born, he he thought it would, but let me go back. Athena came as a warrior out of his, he had a terrible headache and then she was born from his head. Okay. And, uh, but since she was a girl, he said, oh, well, she can live. If it would have been a boy, he would have had her killed, but it was a girl. He said, it's not, it's a girl. She's not going to do anything. So, but the prophecy continues that it is the daughters of the patriarchy who will, the young, the Athenas will actually be the ones to overthrow the patriarchy. And we have it here. Athena is conjunct the moon of the United States. And I feel like the time is right, that it really is the really emergence of a strong emergence of the divine feminine. All right. Uh, let's see what else do I want to say about that anyway. All right. So um, there's a lot going on around all of that. So uh, the empowerment of the feminine. And there's more here because the story continues. It's not just the story of Athena. We've also got the story of Medusa and Athena, super strong at this full moon because the Uranus is still conjunct the star Algol, which is the theme of Medusa, uh, and opposite Athena in Scorpio. And it's square this full moon. We saw that. But first, let's just talk about Uranus. So Uranus brings a sudden change, breakthrough, awakening, rebellion against the status quo, unpredictability, catalyst for change, eccentricity, electricity, and lightning. And um, Uranus is often compared to storms and lightning and rules electricity. So we may be hit with a bolt of lightning out of the blue. That's why I'm sitting in front of this lightning. And once something is struck by lightning, it's never the same. Um, where there can be sudden spiritual awakening, lightning striking with flashes of insight, the lifting of the veil of illusion in one mo moment and seeing the reality behind the illusion. Uh, Uranus also shows us our own brilliance and genius, and it's activating both sun and moon. So if you have planets or angles uh, from 23 to 30 degrees of the fixed signs, you're, this may be very impactful and your life may never be the change, may, may never be the same. Uh, there's also much change and uncertainty in the field. Anything can happen. Life may not look the same by the next new moon. And like I said, you know, this is happening at the Democratic Convention. Uh, you know, I could certainly see protest and, and just things are not as settled as they seem because there is a lot of unrest in the field, put it that way, a lot of unrest and a, and a need for change. 
Um, and since it's the uh, impacting the moon, it's an earthquake on our emotional foundations, shaking us awake while creating chaos as we find the world is just not the same. Uh, and of course, we've got squares here and squares, squares are challenges. They kind of throw out the gauntlet, but squares give birth to creative new ideas, to new solutions. And the, the storm that is cleansing and purifying, but clears the way so you can see the path that was not visible before. It gets rid, it's getting rid of old emotional debris and the emotional field to be able to open up a new perspective because often our perspective is tied to our emotions and Uranus can bring much clear insight. Uh, like I said, there may be some surprises at the Democratic Convention, huge protest. Uh, as, your, as Aquarius and Uranus are both connected to revolutions and unveiling the uh, illusion of, of who our political parties really are and who they serve. And it's not the people, okay? Uh, there may be some powerful women revolutionaries who show up at this time. Athena in Scorpio gives us the X-ray vision to look into the core of the matter and gives us the ability for clear sight, just to clearly see what is true and what is not true, okay? what is in our world and in our lives. And then, of course, we have Algol, uh, who is related to Medusa. The Algol, uh, Algol called the Demon Star is at Taurus, 26 degrees, 30 minutes, and Uranus is activating the star over the next year. And it's associated with the myth of Medusa and the patriarchal dominate, dominator cultural shift that was happening at the time of this story and the denigration and disempowerment of the divine feminine. It's a violation of the divine feminine that needs to be rectified. And so originally Medusa was part of a triple goddess of wisdom, Athena being intellect, Metis being intuition, and Medusa being instinct. And in another version, uh, <clears throat> Medusa was a priestess of Athena who was ravaged by Poseidon in Athena's temple. And in response, Athena made Medusa hideous with snakes in her hair and, and that she could turn men to stone just by looking at them was the, the original evil eye. And with that evil eye, like I said, she could turn men to stone. So Perseus was given the task of decapitating her to stop the evil eye. And so some of the images are of, you know, Perseus holding her head and actually giving it to Athena and placing it on her breastplate, okay, uh, so that she never forgot her matriarchal roots. But it's also about how we became disconnected from the primal wisdom of our bodies and Mother Earth with this decapitation of Medusa. And I feel like this myth is playing out now. It's wanting to be healed. To re so we reclaim the sacredness of our bodies as the gifts, as a gift of the divine mother. This was given to us as a gift from the divine mother. Our bodies, you know, mother and matter um, are, have the same origin. Uh, and as we do, it awakens our kundalini life force and we can become whole again. Because where we're really moving into is an embodied spirituality. The ascension process is taking place in our bodies. And as we, re as we raise the vibration of our bodies through this kundalini activation, it also activates our light bodies. Okay, And it's about aligning with the vibration of Mother Earth, which is the divine feminine. And we heal Mother Earth by healing ourselves and the empowerment of the divine feminine once again. Because the divine feminine and divine masculine need to come back into balance um, to to, cre to create this new world. Um, it's like, you know, the, when you've got, you know, like a seesaw, you know, it needs to be in balance and one has more power than the other. It's out of balance. And I feel like that's what this myth is about is being reenacted. And of course there is much violation of the divine feminine still going on through sexual violation, war and aggression. Uh, and I feel like the divine mother uh, is rising up and saying that, that she, this is, no, she's had enough. I feel this message very strongly. And it may be the same message that the Kogi are receiving of, 
potential earthly cataclysms at the end of 2026 unless we are able to heal ourselves. It's not that we have to heal our world. We have to heal ourselves because when we heal ourselves, we heal the world. This is the shift. And it, it all it takes is a tipping point. It doesn't have to be the whole world. But I, I have read that uh, 1,700 um, or that one awakened person carries the power of 1,700 unawakened people. And so the point is to align with Mother Earth because she is ascending. And for us to go through this ascension process, we need to align with her, okay? And we must heal our hearts to heal the world. And as I said, it only takes a fraction of the people. It's about at the tipping point. So it's so important that each one of us do our own work and as we know, as within, so without, the outer world is a reflection of our inner world. And to change the outer world, we must change ourselves. Okay. And as we change the world, it becomes fertile ground for the new creative energies flowing in. There's the solar flares are coming in so strongly now, and we are traveling through the photon belt. There is so much help from the universe. Our job was still is to heal our hearts because that is what aligns us with mother earth. All right. Now the sun is at the focal point of a yod with the release point at the full moon in Aquarius. So the yacht or the, the finger of fate uh, is the focus on, is on the apex of the sun, Mercury, uh, Vesta conjunction in Leo. And so it's focusing on the heart, listening to your heart and then speaking and sharing from that place, explosive love and light from our hearts and sending it out into the collective. There is like a, when you think of a boomerang, there's a tremendous amount of energy behind it. And so Leo is the heart and Aquarius is the, the, the networking. Okay. And sends it out into the world and changes the collective consciousness. It's called, and the empowerment and leadership of the divine feminine. It's called a boomerang. And so once again, like I said, it's about sending this love and empowerment of the divine feminine out into the world. And Neptune and Pluto sextile as the part of the yod. It is a cycle spiritual journey as within, so without. We must let go of the old baggage to align with the new spiritual energies coming in to create this new world. All right. Now, we also have the T-square of Saturn. Well, first, let's start with the square of Saturn in Pisces, square Jupiter in Gemini, because this is part of a bigger cycle. And it's also the exact square is happening on July 19th at 17 degrees, 27 minutes on the Aquarius full moon. So this begins, this part, this, this cycle began the last time Jupiter and Saturn met on uh, December 21st, 2020, and it was called the Great Conjunction. They met at zero degrees Aquarius, which is called the Aquarius Pivot Point. And the important thing to know is that these two planets meet every 20 years, and they create what is called the zeitgeist, or the spirit of the age for the next 20 years. But this was even bigger because uh, for the last 200 years, Jupiter and Saturn have been meeting in Earth signs, except for once. Uh, and now for the next 200 years, they're going to be meeting in air signs, which is really a different zeitgeist. It's very much more about the use of the mind and uh, uh, growing in that way. All right. And I feel like it has to do with our understanding of how we're using the quantum field. All right. Um, and so anyway, and, and Pluto has been transiting that zero degrees, uh, the Aquarius pivot point. All right. And so, but anyway, as part of the cycle, this is what's called the first quarter square. When they're meeting up, they haven't met up since, uh, you know, December 21st, 2020. It's called the first quarter square. And um, the first quarter square is called a crisis in action. What are we going to do? And Jupiter is about expansion and Saturn is about contraction. It's a dance between... Uh, how to help the expansion is about growing, but Saturn is about like pruning. It's about focus growth, uh, allowing ourselves to continue to grow, but also kind of keeping us in um, better uh, boundaries. What, what is working? What is not? Okay. So it's like pruning, bringing focus growth. 
and Jupiter and Saturn, when they are, are dancing together in a square, uh, we, we enter a period of significant test obstacles, and it's about restructuring. Saturn is so much about restructuring. Uh, this is a global transit that impacts all of humanity, humanity, setting the stage for a new societal paradigm. Okay. All right. And it destabilizes outward structures. And, and though disorienting, this breakdown enables innovation and regeneration. All right. Now, specifically for this full moon, what is it saying? Because it's also in a T-square because Saturn opposes Venus and black moon Lilith while it's squaring Jupiter and Mars. So it's another myth of the feminine that is being activated. And um, Lilith is a dark goddess who has been demonized for her sexual freedom and independence. She's also been likened to Kali and carries a sword of truth. Uh, she cuts away what it what is not true, what is not authentic. And Venus in Virgo um, is reserved, humble, observant, practical, sensible, and in service. Venus in Virgo is a priestess of healing and a priestess of the earth. And the shadow of Venus in Virgo is being self-critical and fussy. Whereas in Black Moon, Lilith uh, also brings up uh, the shadow of showing us those places where we don't yet love ourselves and ultimately where it spills out into criticism of others. It is about the illusion of perfection and how releasing that illusion is so much about self-empowerment because Lilith is ultimately about self-empowerment, freedom and independence. And to know that being human is not about perfection. It is about learning and growing and that we learn more from our mistakes than our successes. And conjunct Venus, it brings in self-worth issues, not feeling good enough. And to know, to and, and opposite Saturn, to know this is conditioning. Um, this is not even our own stuff. We were born with this. I, I kind of feel like this is a, a, a piece of, uh, of what we would call original sin being born into this illusion that somehow we're not good enough and the importance of releasing it and knowing that it is only an illusion and that it is something that we took on when we entered into this field, but it is our job to let it go. All right, Saturn in Pisces. Um, Saturn is, well, first I wanna talk about time because you know Saturn, you know, his Greek name was Kronos. And so it's so much about time. And we know time is speeding up. And I read an article saying that it is absolutely true that time is speeding up um, as we are shifting these realities. And that we know that time is only a construct to help us navigate the 3D reality. Uh, in reality, the true reality behind the illusion is that there is no time, that uh, everything is existing at the same time. Uh, Saturn is structure. But in Pisces, those structures do not have solid boundaries. So we may start to perceive that we are existing in more than one reality. Saturn has about consensus reality and our consensus reality is changing to become more dimensional, more interdimensional. Uh, and behind the illusion is the reality that there are many realities. And your perception of reality is your experience. No, this is true for everyone. There is not just one reality. We each are actually living within our own. And how you work in the quantum field is uh, how you determine your reality. You create your reality by the choices you make. And it's time to start, as we are shifting into a more fifth dimensional reality, which is based in love, it is time to release the fear of the 3D reality, making choices out of fear, making choices out of what you're afraid will happen versus claiming what it is you really want, putting your prayers in motion, believing and trusting that you're creating in the quantum field and that the old reality does not have to exist. OK, um, and as I said, the Saturn opposite Venus BLM, uh, Black Moon Lilith, it's about healing self-worth issues with compassion and understanding. OK, and square Mars, uh, square Mars and Jupiter 
Uh, and so the Jupiter and Mars are conjunct the fixed star Regal at 17 degrees, 10 minutes of Gemini and Orion. And, uh, you know, Mars, of course, is a warrior. So this is a warrior energy that is, is being activated here. And um, Regal is known as a dragon star. And the dragon stars are warrior, is a warrior energy that serves divine will. And this indicates the warrior skill in martial arts, being balanced in all elements and moving gracefully through the field. So it's about to accomplish our goals. We need to have balance within ourselves, balance, you know, in our thoughts, in our emotions, uh, in our fire and grounded in earth. Okay. Control over our anger. Put it that way. Fire would be kind of, it could be very eruptive. So, so to be able to control all of those things within ourselves uh, and Jupiter and Mars together is about self-confidence and courage. And to pursue, pursue your goals with focus and inner serenity, grounded within yourself and Mother Earth and in the present moment. And Jupiter brings in unlimited possibilities, and it depends on the choices we make as to the path that we go down, or we could call it the timeline. And this is the healing that we are moving out of a fear-based 3D reality into a fifth dimensional love-based reality and to understand that we create our own reality by the choices we make. So know that you deserve to have what is in your highest good and that you have the free will choice to be able to do that. Because this is the healing is really is knowing we deserve to have what it is we want and to meet fear with love to make choices based in love on what you want instead of what you fear. And to also know that a change of direction is absolutely possible. You know, that old saying about the best laid plans, it's important to be flexible. So in conclusion, I feel like this full moon is about opening your heart and sharing the love. And as we do, we raise not only our vibration, but that of the whole collective and align with Mother Earth. It is only the love in our hearts that will create a new world. It's about the empowerment of the divine feminine coming into balance with the divine masculine for manifestation. And as we heal our hearts, we heal the world and we are moving towards a tipping point. Conscious co-creation through conflict, that new ideas are born, that we are creating our reality in every moment. So choose love and what your heart desires. You deserve it. Sudden awakenings like a bolt of lightning, a lightning and the activation of our kundalini, the, the power, the shakti, the divine power of the divine mother and understanding of the bigger picture and the reality behind the illusion. All right. So this is a very powerful full moon. Um, wishing you all a wonderful month full of many blessings. Um, and if you like this video, please check like and subscribe. It is really helpful to me when you're when you do that. And if you would like uh, a reading, know that all my information is in the description box below. All right. Namaste and many blessings to all.